This is Larry Anderson, and that was one of the greatest nights of my life. I'm John Crook, and I second that emotion. It was the night that the 1993 Phillies won the National League East after rising from the ashes of last place the year before. We were a team full of misfits and castoffs that nobody believed in. Nobody but ourselves. And now, after the passage of time, it's important to look back and see why this team won and how we captured the hearts of an entire city. And for a few weeks in October, how we captured the attention of the whole country. You know, Larry, we didn't have the most talent in the league. We just wanted it more than everybody else. Yeah, Johnny, and we had more fun playing the game than any team I've ever seen before or since. And do you know exactly what I felt like that night? No, what? A silly old ant. Once there was a silly old ant, thought he'd eat a rubber tree plant. Anyone knows an ant can eat a rubber tree plant, but he has If you're looking for the seeds of the success of the 93 Phillies, I think it began in 1991. We were swept by the Pirates in an early series and manager Jim Fergosi called a rare team meeting. He really aired us out, pointing out how we played scared and were intimidated by the Pirates. A group of us vowed that would never happen again. The following year, injuries in a weak bullpen sent us to the cellar again. Then a funny thing happened. By September, we realized that Darren Dalton had a shot at an RBI title. Guys started to play harder, moving runners, taking an extra base, anything to give Dutch a shot at knocking in a run. And damn if he didn't do it. Only the fourth catcher in history to win an RBI crown. And not only did it help galvanize the nucleus of the team, but when the smoke cleared, we had scored more runs than any other team in the league except the Pirates, who beat us by two. Going into spring training of 93, we knew that if we got decent pitching and could stay healthy, we'd be right there. Spring training. It was my second tour of duty with the Phils, and I was glad to be back. Welcome back to Philadelphia, and uh, what made you want to come back here? Oh, you, Wills, you. <laughs> Only you. Only you. Yeah, that's the, that was my sole reason, because uh, my other chance was to go to Atlanta, and I figured they'd be in the World Series, but it would really cut down on my chances to see you. So here I am. You really could have signed with the Braves? Sometimes you have to have a feel for this game, pal. And I wasn't the only newcomer happy to be in camp. Yeah, we had a bunch of new lunatics to accompany you. Guys like Pete Incavilia, Danny Jackson, David West. And back for his second stint, Milt Thompson. Then, of course, there's Izzy. Jim Eisenreich was a free agent outfielder who came to camp under a cloak of mystery. It was common knowledge that he had suffered for years with the neurological condition Tourette's syndrome. He had the disease under control, but Izzy was so quiet, nobody knew what to expect until you broke the ice. Hey, he's sitting at his locker playing with a bow and arrow, looking like he might be after a victim. So I started calling him Jeffrey Dahmer. He loved it. As you know, my nickname is Jeffrey Dahmer, and I'll do anything I can to help this team win. He threatened Dutch with a bow and arrow today. He's going to shoot him in the leg. Later that spring, his wife told me it was the first time Jim was made to feel so much a part of the team. Anything to oblige, ma'am? I remember uh, Izzy coming in the clubhouse and... <laughs> 
Uh, Jake said, hey, you're the, you got that Tourette's thing, whatever. You, you know, if you, if you think you're crazy, wait till you see this crew. And uh, everybody bust out, you know, and started laughing there. And after that, it, it just kind of snowballed from there. And I've never been around a group of guys that enjoyed being together on and off the field as much as, as that team. Right off the bat, you could tell there was a camaraderie there, and that hadn't been there. It was really probably the closest knit group of guys I've ever had the pleasure to, to manage. They, uh, they really liked each other. They, they were, I call them clubhouse rats. They liked baseball. They liked to talk about baseball. They liked to uh, be involved. We had a lot of fun in the clubhouse. We had a lot of fun off the field. But uh, when it came to playing baseball, man, everybody was on the same page. Another important event that spring was when Dave Hollins laid down his decree to the Phillies pitchers. He had set a record the previous year with 19, uh, being hit 19 times as a switch hitter. He says, but I've been thinking about this, and if I charge the mound, I'm gonna be suspended for four games. So instead of charging the mound, I'll just charge you in our clubhouse if you don't stick up for me or any of our players. He said, if you guys don't hit somebody, he said, I'll just fight you after the game. You know, and that's how they went, no, 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 we'll protect you. And three weeks later, it just so happened that Greeny was pitching in an exhibition game in St. Pete against the Cardinals, and they hit him. Tommy Green was sweating bullets on the mound there. I didn't know what he was doing, and he sure enough, he hit him right in the neck. <laughs> I did what I needed to do. I thought like I needed to do. So it happened to be the first guy was the pitcher. So it was perfect. I get hit on an 0-2 pitch that barely brushes me. He hits Donovan Osborne in the neck in St. Petersburg, and we start an all-out brawl, and that just, I mean, we had fights in spring training that year, and it just set the tone. <laughs> we just got teams knew we weren't gonna, we weren't gonna take that. I knew on the mound that I could throw at anybody I wanted to, and there was no one in the league that was gonna get that 60 feet to the mound before he made that 60 foot trick from third base, and that was incredibly comfortable. And it wasn't that he was gonna be a roadblock, he'd kill somebody. I mean, I, I honestly believe that he had uh, the potential to, uh, to actually slay someone on the field if he wanted to. That, that's where the team got closer, and then you start caring about your pitchers too, and the players, and everybody, I mean, that, that pitching staff, that's the closest pitching staff I've ever been around with a team. I mean, we used to hang out with each other and go out and drink together. And a lot of teams, that's a separate gig, I found out later, but not with that group. It was obvious that there was a whole new tone to this ball club. We were no longer going to be doormats. It was kind of like we all said to each other, enough's enough. Let's, uh, everybody's picking us to finish last, second, last, whatever. We had all seen the predictions that we were supposed to finish last behind Florida and they were an expansion team and if you looked at our roster I mean if you just strictly went by what was on paper they were probably pretty accurate to pick that and I've always I've been a huge believer in the theory that you can judge the dog in the fight but you can't judge the fight in the dog and it's all about winning and pride and and we're gonna go out and beat somebody and beat them bad I mean that's what we wanted to do and it started from day one of spring training and uh, continued on through the season one more important event took place that spring the Phillies stepped up and signed Dutch to a long-term deal. They could have waited to see how the year played out, but the timing was perfect. The best catcher in baseball will be in a Phillies uniform for five or six more years, maybe more than that. Uh, Dutch says he wants to play till he's 40. It sent a message that the team is committed to taking care of their own, that performance and leadership would be rewarded. It made me personally feel like uh, I was the anchor of that club, and uh, that I, I need to step forward and uh, take on a leadership role. It, it was time to focus on winning. And uh, boy, what a, what a group of guys to share it with. And on that note, we headed into one of the most magical seasons in recent history. Since 1984, what a job. And a fly ball hit well to left center field, and this ball is out of here. Swing of the Bears, he struck him out to end the ball game. Thompson, he's hit. Morandini scores. Truck is coming around. The ball gets through. Dalton's going to be able to score, too. Thompson has.
is a bases clear. We came out of the chute smoking. First, we swept the Astros, who had spent a lot of money in the offseason and were supposed to be really good. That gave us the confidence to come back home and take eight of the first nine games. Deep left center. This ball's got a chance. Out of here. It seemed like every game brought a different hero. Rock him out in the ball game. Go to the plate and out. Swing, bouncing ball right back to West. Grabs it, throws him out. This ball game is over. The fighting Bills are eight and one. Equaling the very best start of the season in franchise history along with a 1915 Philly. Yeah, I remember watching from the video room one long, long night when you sent us home happy. The right center field. Bell is back. It's out of here. A home run for the Crockers. And the Phillies have won it 14 4 to 3 here at Veterans Stadium just after the hour of midnight. When we hit the road, the magic continued. He caught it. Thompson caught the ball. A terrific catch by Bill Thompson. If we didn't beat you with our bats, we did it with defense. And true to our motto, we weren't afraid of anybody. How about Mother's Day, when Mariano Duncan faced one of the nastiest closers in the game, Lee Arthur Smith. Down by three with the game on the line. It might be! It could be! Slam! A grand slam home run! Mariano Duncan! Can you believe it? The Phillies lead six to five in the eighth. I believe from the day that Dunk hit the grand slam off Lee Smith here that uh, that we had we were writing our own script. We were writing our own script, and it was filled with crazy characters, swashbuckling heroes, lots of suspense, and nonstop action. Ball in the hole, a base hit. Here comes Thompson. Can goes through. He scores. Phillies win. And a bunch of happy endings. Halfway through the season, we were well out in front of the pack. And we had a style of play and a certain flair that the Philadelphia fans really responded to. Everybody in America could relate to some guy on that team. And that's the, the, the kind of personalities that we have. Well, there was a freak from every walk of life in that clubhouse. That was the whole thing. We had guys with physical problems, mental problems, and I mean, the list went on and on. And every beer drinker and guys that ate a hot dog loved John Cruck. And Every woman loved Aaron Dalton, and every blue-collar, redneck guy in the world loved Dykstra. And we had a bunch of gamers there, you know? I mean, everybody everybody was game on in that club, starting with, you know, the manager and our coaches, and, you know, we came out of the gates, and everybody started picking everybody up, and it was just like a domino effect, man. We couldn't, you know, once we started, then the fans got in, and it was like we wouldn't take no for an answer. We played together hard, and weren't going to let anybody intimidate us, and we used that to our advantage, and the home field advantage was huge. We used to have a few tough road trips that year, I remember, and we couldn't wait to get home, and nobody wanted to come and play us there that year. I think everybody else in the league knew what kind of guys were on that team. Um, you know, we weren't just baseball players, we were hard baseball players. I mean, we were guys that physically wanted to beat you, not only in the runs column, but we wanted to beat you physically. You knew it was going to be a battle, you know, because they were a scrappy bunch, and we always took it very seriously when we came to Philadelphia, because you, know, you, you knew that with the guys that they had out there on the field, it was going to be a, it was going to be a war. We didn't care what anybody thought of us. We just knew we were kicking somebody's ass that night and we were gonna have fun before it happened and after it happened. 
Really, that club had a lot of pride. They were tough. They, uh, they were a group of tough individuals. 25 guys there and whoever came in, I mean, there was no, no one could break that circle. So, you know, I mean, hey, if you wasn't a part of that thing, you just wasn't a part of it. It just seemed like everybody that put on that uniform that year did something great to help us win. And uh, I think that's what makes that team so memorable is that, you know, there's so many different guys that did so many different things to help us win all the time. So what were some of the other keys to our success? Well, like most things in baseball, it starts with pitching. Terry Mulholland had been with the staff the longest. A quiet and calm type, Terry was off to a good start. Hi, I'm Kurt Schilling, and I play for the Phillies, and I'm the ace hey, on the staff. Enough about me. What do you think of me? Tommy Green and Kurt Schilling were two younger guys who seemed to be in friendly competition with each other. Man, boy, you big country dope. Both were thriving on it. Big Ben Rivera did a great job as a number five starter, winning 13 games. But the biggest addition to the staff was Danny Jackson, a proven veteran who had already been on two world champions and had the perfect mental makeup for this team. With an emphasis on mental. He was crazy. He was nuts. He brought a lot of things to this club. It's like having a WWF come to camp. You know, I mean, uh, Danny's, Danny was very, very, uh, very aggressive, very intense individual when he took the field. And, uh, you know, he, he liked to pass that intensity along to his teammates. And DJ's a guy who, you know, would have died for, actually almost died on the bus for this team. Uh, splitting his forehead open, but. Uh... Once on a team bus, our resident nutcase tried to fire everybody up by headbutting the luggage rack. He has got blood pouring from the top of his head all the way down his shirt, all the way down, and a, I mean, a pool of blood. And so Irish and, and Mark come back, Mark's our trainer, Mark comes back and comes back, and they're butterflying his forehead. He's got a gash by about this long across his forehead, and, it's a, and he's smiling. He's got all this blood in his teeth, and he, it almost looked like he was happy he did it. And the head chef of this spicy gumbo was Johnny Padres, the veteran pitching coach whose salty, old-school demeanor combined with a positive, upbeat approach. He had his way. He had a knack about getting something out of you. It was just a fire that, in his old-school way of bringing it out. Pods to us was like Yoda to Luke Skywalker. He, uh, I believed he could float if he wanted to. I needed that, you know. It helps puff you up. Tell you what you want to hear, really, if you suck or not, you're out there on the man. You got great stuff and you're giving up the world. You might. <laughs> Pods was the father figure the young guys needed. Oh, yeah? How about the old guys? You were the oldest player in the league that year, but you acted like you were in T ball. I watched LA and thought, you know, I'm supposed to be watching veterans to understand how to play the game, and if I did anything that he's doing right now, I'd get released. Well, Johnny, you know my motto. You're only young once, but, but you, you can, can be, be immature, immature forever. forever. Another reason for our success was the team concept style of play. There'll probably never be another pennant winning team to use three different platoons. I agree, Johnny. The salary structure and mindset of today's players makes it difficult. In 93, six different players shared three positions. Isaac and West Chamberlain split right field. Inky and Milt split left. And Dunk and Mick split second base. When we went on that field, I mean, we were a unit and we played together. And uh, like I said, it was no, there was no, no me. <laughs> I think it's great that everybody that suits up every day feels a part of that ball club and Milt was a big part of that ball club. I mean, Milt got some huge hits for us. Milt made some fantastic plays in the outfield. Milt was a better outfielder than I was. It was a great mix in there and uh, there was no egos really involved in there. And Jimmy and Wes in right field were fantastic. 
I mean, you know, can you say enough about Jim Eisen, right? I mean, he just kind of waltzed in there about three days before spring training and, you know, hit 330. I think that was the, the hardest thing for Wes to understand, that, you know, the role that we put him in would, would benefit the, the team more. You know, you can't, you're not going to set an Eisen right on the bench. I remember John Vukovic coming up to me telling me that how proud he was of me and how much I had matured and how much respect that, uh, that uh, I, he, he said I really gained his respect and that had meant a lot to me. To me, at platooning at least two positions is what the National League game is about. Uh, everybody likes to have a set lineup, uh, set players. Uh, here you go in and you write the lineup up and down, uh, the same lineup every day. When you have at least two platoons in the National League, uh, what that does is it keeps two guys on your bench. It keeps them sharp. In the National League, your bench is who ends up winning the games for you. Everybody to a man knew what their job was. And Fergosi is the one that created that atmosphere. Anytime you have a manager that walks up to you and says, you are going to do this, you can prepare for it. Kim Batiste knew what his role was. Ricky Jordan knew what his role was. And the thing that made him different, no one bitched. For Ghost was the best manager I ever played for. He understood that you managed 25 different people. And to make that 25, those 25 different people be the best one unit they could be, you had to treat people differently. He'd been through all the wars and, and everybody respected him and they never crossed that line. You know, and he was one of the guys, but he, I think that he felt that it was important to know the personalities of his players. And he was very good at that. And he wrote that lineup card out and said, hey, go get them, boys. And while Fergosi filled out the lineup card and turned us loose, the guy that really made this team go was Darren Dalton. No doubt, Dutch was, was our captain, he was our leader, and I mean, you want to talk about a guy that uh, you want in your foxhole. I had a rapport with Dutch that I could call him in my office. I could tell him what I want done, and he could go out in the club. Because, let's face it, players get sick and tired of hearing it from a manager or a coach. Uh, he was the heart and soul of our ball club. Uh... You know, Lenny was Lenny was a great player, but uh, Darren was was the leader of our ball club. He was like our quarterback, and, and you know, we went out there knowing that we had him back there, and he was kind of like our wall. For my money, Darren was a manager of that team. Darren managed personalities. I've never seen anyone that could deal with a team the way Darren did. It's all about going out and winning every day. I mean, that's the only thing that's important to him. He's the only guy I've ever seen that can go through an 0 for 15 slump. But as long as we were winning, he. Uh, nothing, nothing faced him. He made me believe, whether it was true or not, that what he was doing behind the plate was the most important thing in the world to him that day. And whether he got a hit or not, uh, well, we're working on, on a game, and that's what matters to me. And when you're on the mound, catchers probably don't ever, won't understand how important that is to a pitcher. I think the fact that he went through nine knee surgeries uh, gave him even more credibility. And the fact he might throw you around the room, you know, I mean, uh, there was this Hollywood guy and all that, but a, a lot of the public didn't know that this was a real, real tough guy. The surgeries he's gone through, I mean, he's as tough as they come. Everybody who's played with him knows that. He's just fortunate enough to look good, too, while he's doing it. You know? Some of us don't have that luxury. <laughs> he's got to lead by example. And he's also uh, has to sometimes come down on his best friends, and he would do that. All Bubba had to do was look at you half the time, and he knew. You know. And he looked at me, and he said, I, I just want to I want to kick your ass right now. And he was dead serious, and I knew he was serious. And and I was embarrassed about the way I had pitched, and I said, I, you'd have every right to. He got me right away when I walked in the duck in the clubhouse. He said, I didn't sleep at all last night. I was dreaming about fighting you last night. I didn't sleep a wink. I can't believe you walked, and I, he was right, too. I said, hey, man, you're right. I popped me, man, go ahead. I mean, I deserve it. He cared that much where he couldn't even sleep that night, and then I, you know, I knew who the, the leader of that team was right there. Now, a lot's been made out of this so-called macho row.
a group of tough guys who allegedly controlled the clubhouse. I didn't see it that way. Ah, uh, that was the creation of the media. What really determined the clubhouse dynamic was a group of guys who got together after the game. Dutch would have to ice his knees for at least 30 minutes, so a bunch of us would hang out with him in the trainer's room, discuss the game. It got to be a popular routine. The trainer's room looked like a smoke-filled bar room. Beer cups and, you know, filled up ashtrays and spittoons and everything else. And little by little, there were more and more guys in there. Off the field, we talk about the games and then talk about how we were going to get better and what we had to do tomorrow to win. So it was like 24-7 trying to figure out how to, how to win the National League. Some of the fondest memories of just going in there and, and you know, being with a group of guys who have just done ba battle out on the field and, and left everything they had out on that field for that night. They could talk about the game, where the game was followed up or how we won the game. And it, it was something that really lacks a lot of places now. It was a team. Now, just because we were all focused on winning, it didn't mean we all had to like each other. First of all, Mitch and I didn't get along for a day. We had polar opposite personalities. Uh, Shill was a pain in everybody's butt. Once in a while, somebody'd get called into that room uh, when they didn't like something. Kurt Schilling became a problem in our clubhouse quite often, and uh, we had to beat Kurt down a little bit. Every now and then, Mitch would get mad because it might have been a save situation and didn't get a chance to get the save. And and, and Dutch Dutch was great about handling that. You know, he he just he nipped it right in the bud when it started. Heck yeah, we'd sit in there and rip guys up. And, uh, they'd come right in, we'd rip them up, and but that kept everybody loose. Of course, our late night sessions weren't too popular with the ladies in our lives. That was a big part of that team that we used to stick around and guys gave enough about the team where they would say, hey honey, I'm gonna be an hour late tonight, okay? What, what's the worst that's gonna happen? You're gonna bitch at me a little bit? I'm gonna take a little heat? Well, I'm gonna do that because I need to get to know my teammates and talk about the team because we care. We're here, we wanna win. And to make matters worse, I sometimes used to spend the night in the video room. You slept on that rotten couch? You're a braver man than I. I remember the time you were told you had Sunday off and played wiffle ball with the clubhouse guys till 6 a.m. Yeah, I pitched 89 innings and couldn't lift my left arm above the shoulder. Then somebody got hurt and you had to play the outfield and still got three hits that day. Believe it. If you had to pick out a guy to get out of bed and get a base hit to win a ball game, it would be John Crud. One of the only guys that I know that can take that body out there every day. He didn't look like an athlete. He didn't act like an athlete. But he was really a great athlete. I'm sure he'd tell you that by the looks of his body that, that he wasn't a great worker, but he was a great worker. He probably took more extra batting practice than, than anybody. and. He worked at his game. Disliked pitchers immensely, uh, another one. Uh, made life just a living hell for me at times during the year, but. I still remember meeting three or four hot dogs on a Sunday game and spending a night at the ballpark. You'd get three big old hot dogs on a plate and smother with ketchup and throw it in the microwave and pull them out and go to town on them. And they were done in two minutes, you know. And I said, Jay, and it, it'd be 140, 150 out on that turf that day. And I said, Jay, how do you do it? How do you do it? And he said, years of practice. <laughs> Always made you laugh. Uh, but people forget how tough he was. See him sitting in that lounge chair in the training room with bags of ice on his shoulders and his knees and his boiler sticking at three feet out from his stomach and can barely walk. And This guy, you could hand him a two by four and tell him to go up there and get a hit, and he could do it. And I would see him deliberately with nobody out, and man on second, just pull a ground ball to the second baseman, first baseman, and move the runner. Because that's the way you're supposed to play the game, and, and, and that's what Johnny did. You know, I don't think the accolades were very important to Johnny. What was important to Johnny was, was winning and uh, helping the team win. And, you know, as great a player as he probably could have been if he was more selfish, uh, I think he took more pride in doing the right thing every day as a player. In mid-June, we had our first and only major injury. Dave Hollins broke a bone in his hand and was expected to be out six weeks. But Kim Batiste filled in and we never missed a beat. High drive to left, it's deep. Coleman's back, out of here! Game-tying home run, Kim Batiste! 
That really illustrated the strength of our club. All 25 guys were important. Todd Pratt got the job done when Dutch needed a blow. And Ricky Jordan picked you up when you needed it. It would just seem like every day. It was a true team effort. Guys like Mickey Morandini got the job done. And a grand slam! A grand slam! A home run! Mickey Morandini! Mariano Duncan played everywhere and led the league in smiles. Then, remarkably, Dave Hollins came back after only two weeks. I don't know how he did it, and I was afraid to ask. Back then, I was so young and strong and stupid. I just went out there no matter what. As soon as I could grip the bat, I was going out there to grip it and rip it, even though the sutures were barely healed. And, you know, Coop, he can get you ready for anything. That guy's the best trainer around. And... That intensity was unmistakable, and it was, it was impossible to get away from. He's the kind of guy that made other players uncomfortable to not play their hardest. And you had to have that. We had Dutch, and, and Dutch was that kind of guy, but Headley was physically that kind of guy. He would, he would intimidate you into playing the game right if he thought you weren't. That was David. And that's what made David, because David did not have great talent. But he had played with such a fire, and that's what made him a great player. It's our bullpen Hello. coach right here. He's got all our equipment. <laughs> There's no, doc bones, no doctoring bones. of the ball going down in our right. Everything's good. It's a known fact that the smartest and best athletes on any baseball team are usually found in the bullpen. Yes, and the cultural capital of the United States is West Virginia. Hey, if this was supposed to be a team of misfits, then you guys were the kings of the misfits. We took our game very seriously, especially our hitting. The only reason for bullpen pitchers taking BP was strictly for entertainment value. Well, Mitch used to take his hacks like it was life or death. Yeah, it used to kill me just to watch. He'd get so mad and scream at the BP pitcher. Imagine Mitch complaining about a guy not throwing strikes. It's not the ball, Mitch, it's the Indian. <laughs> There's only one Mitchy poo. Then we surrounded him with the likes of you and David West. Oh my God. By mid-season, we added veterans Bobby Thigpen and Roger Mason to the pen, then strapped in for the dog days of summer. It's the deep right field. Chamberlain back. Oh, almost lost it, but makes the catch at the track. A heart-thumping 18th save for the Wild Thing. Yeah, just another one for the Cardinals. Yes, July 2nd was a couple of days I'll never forget. What are you talking about? You know, the doubleheader that started on July 2nd and seemed to end a couple of days later? They finally get the first game finished. The second game didn't start until who knows when, after midnight probably. In the early hours of morning. And so it was a long night. This would be a bad hour for most folks, Harry. This is a shank of the evening for you and... Most oh. of us, I mean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the funny thing is, we really needed a win. Things were starting to slip a little in the wind calm, and a game like this could easily start a downward slide. Swing, ground ball, base hit right field. Here comes Hollins. Billy Beans throw is late. Hollins scores the tying run. Never had this much excitement at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> The bars were closing, and all these people knew this was happening, and that team was a lovable team anyway, so they were coming down, and it got louder and louder and louder the later it got. This is one of those nights that hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people are going to say they were here. Then finally, Mitch was in a position to make all that batting practice pay off. Swing and a base hit! Believe it. 
Only in 93 could something like that have happened. Yeah, and Mitch has been talking about it every year since. Now the shortstop position was kind of a work in progress throughout the season. Yeah, Juan Bell opened the season there, but was just too inconsistent. Batiste and Duncan filled in, but we needed them to come off the bench. And so the last piece of the puzzle was added on July 7th. I think probably the biggest key was bringing up Stocker. And I can, to this day, I can hear Larry Boa. Every single day, Larry was going, bring up Stocker, bring up Stocker, bring up Stocker. I can still remember the video image of Boa standing next to him by the bat rack. And Stocker's picking up bats, and he, we looked at him and goes, don't worry about those, you win with this, you win with it. Like, real smart Alec. You know, like, I don't care what you hit. And Stock hits like 340 and plays gold glove defense for us. First guy I went to was Bo, and I said, Larry, I said, they're bringing us up. And you know in that high pitch, he said, you think he can play? You think he can play? <laughs> Fortunately for us, Stock wasn't the least bit intimidated. <laughs> you get an overall player. You guys leave him the f At first, I went. Stock, remember, these are the same guys ripping you at first. Uh -huh. <laughs> Stock's first game in red pinstripes was nothing special. Mitch blows a lead, Stock bailed you out in the ninth. The game goes 20 innings. You, Westy, and Mitch get to watch the game in the comfort of the video room cafe. Mike Williams pitches six great innings for the win, and you knuckleheads parade around the clubhouse like you had something to do with it. We did. If it wasn't for us messing up in the first place, it never would have happened. Anyway, we forgot to mention how that game was won. Down by a run in the top of the 20th, up stepped the man who was having a year like no other teammate I've seen before or since. People that are left here are just Warren, Lenny, Lenny. Deep to left field, Eric Davis going back, still going back, he can't get it! It's a battle for Lenny Dykstra, and the Phillies are gonna win this ball game! And they win it seven to six in 20 innings! That year, there was no finer leadoff hitter that has ever played this game. When the cameras were on, or when the pressure was on, when the game mattered the most, he wanted the bat in his hands. He wanted the ball hit to him. He wanted to play. He wanted to be the guy to have to make the play. So fun to watch him set the tone. Just his cockiness, his attitude, his swagger, whatever you want to call it. Just being Lenny, the dude. My job was to, to, to get things going and, and to to spark us. I mean, people, you know, don't understand, I think, how important it is to have somebody at the top of the order that can provide a spark and, and ignite some energy. So that was my job. And, you know, I took pride in that and taking certain pitches and, and not swinging at pitches. He'd get on base, he'd take pitches. When you talk about keys for a season, we got into a lot of bullpens early because of the number of pitches that when he, he took and he fouled pitches off and he got on base and did a great job. And he set the tone right from the first first inning when he stepped into that batter's box. You very seldom saw him swing at a first pitch. He worked the count. You don't know what the pitcher's throwing that day. You don't know what kind of stuff he's got. And we would always say, dude, what's this guy got? He said, you'll know. And then he would go up there and make this guy throw 10 pitches. And that helps the rest of the ball club. And he would take till he got two strikes and then foul off about five pitches. And that's a, that's a consummate leadoff hitter right there, a guy that's going to him, give himself up. And then it just sort of filtered down. The Dutch worked it, Dave Hollins worked it. Uh, you know, we had guys that, that weren't afraid to hit with two strikes. They played the game very unselfish. They, uh, they moved runners when they had to. They dropped a bunt when they had to. But Dykstra was a guy that if you needed a home run, he'd do that. If you needed a stolen base, he'd do that. If you needed a walk, he would do that. And so we sort of, we sort of fed off him. We outscored everybody by 100 runs for one reason. They would take a walk. They trusted each other. They knew that they weren't forced to be the only guy in the lineup to get the hit to win the game. They trusted each other the fact, well, I'll get a walk here and get somebody on base. And we had a lot of big innings because of walks. Knowing dude and, and uh, seeing the way that he went about it and, and everybody else's reaction to him 
and then his reaction towards them uh, was, that was, that's a book in itself right there. By late summer, we'd build up such a big lead on the rest of the division, it would be tough to catch us. We were traveling the country, beating up on everybody, and acquiring quite a reputation. You could ask a lot of bellmen around the, the leg at the team hotels that we stayed at, you know, and they'd, they'd tell you that, you know, when the Phillies came to town, um, we never really got to our rooms till probably five, six o'clock in the morning anyway, so. The only hours of sleep that are important are the ones you get before midnight. <laughs> so basically, I should be dead. <laughs> no sleep, not needed. <laughs> Even some of our opponents liked our act. Take that rookie catcher on the Dodgers. And they had such a cool team as far as, I mean, they all had the mullets. I, and I grew my mullet to try to look like these guys and you know, all scruffy and stuff. And looking at the pictures now, it doesn't look great. But, uh, you know, it was a time that, uh, you know, these guys went out and they had fun and they, they loved to play and they loved to win. And it came across the fact that when you played them, you knew you were in for a game that uh, they were going to try and kick your butt. But by September, we started to leak a little oil. Sit two runs will score and this game is over. Montreal has won it. Mitch had some trouble in Montreal and knew he was going to hear it when we got back to town. But you helped him out. Hopefully the Phillies can, can play good against the, the Marlins here. We can get that harmony back together between the fans and the players and, and everything. It's a uh, testy time of the year. You guys went through this. Oh, man, it's testy for everybody. Exactly. Uh, anything to lighten up the atmosphere. But our once huge lead was now down to four games. I can be honest with you. We, <laughs> we had some panic in the back room a couple times uh, in the coaching staff. And, and when I say panic, I mean, we weren't panicking, but we were uneasy because we weren't playing good. And, and the guy that never changed his demeanor through the whole thing was Fergosi. And he was a great rock through that whole thing. Calm in the eye of the storm at all times. I don't think the players don't notice that. Players will always look to their manager on how to react. And he stays calm, and they try to stay calm. Swing a weak ground ball to second. More indeed, he took crack. Take a deep breath, everybody. The magic number is nine. Line drive hit the right field. This game is over. Longmire scores, and the Phillies win on a bases loaded single by Dave Hollins in the bottom half of the 12th inning. Two men on base and two outs. Ninth inning. Bulls lead 3 0. 57,000 plus here at the bat. Struck him out. And the ball game. Mitch Williams recording his 41st save. That's a new Phillies season record. Saves it for Tommy Green, who pitched just brilliant baseball for the Phillies. As the Phils take this with three nothing over the Atlanta Braves. Let it go. We finished strong down the stretch and got the magic number down to one by September 27th. How about Cracker Rose? I tell you, I give this club a lot of credit. When they got together in the spring, we knew it was an improved club because we saw it. But uh, I'd be a liar if I said I thought they'd be sitting here. September 28th with the magic number one and maybe the sad thing about it you might not ever see it again at least these guys all together like this and it's re it's really been an outstanding year one that that they won't ever forget and we won't either what we did in 93 was was something that unless you were in there and, and in, in, in the trenches with us you don't realize how every night someone else would pick us up and, and it was a complete team effort. Phil is going into this game Whitey can clinch it tonight National League East and looking at the face of the players in the clubhouse it looks like they have great resolve to do that thing tonight. around this team how much they want to win here.
It was the best party I've ever seen. A wild, dysfunctional family of players, coaches, staff, and executives, all tasting the fruits of a true team effort. We took it deep into the night. We know we're going to be underdogs and just go. <laughs> Swing and a long drive. Grand slam. Home run by the Duck. How about that? I even decided to sow the seeds of my broadcasting career. This is the first time you've been in a playoffs in your career. I you've been you've there played yet. right. This is the first time that, that you've been there yet. This is the first time you've clinched a divisional oh, championship. Okay. Can, can you tell us what it feels like? What's it like with with these guys, with these teammates? How does it feel to you? You having a good hair day? I'm having a great you hair day. You are having a good hair day. Thank you. Look at that. You He's have, having a great wow. hair day. <laughs> what do you think about the chances of a 10-year reunion with this ball club? Uh, no, no chance. Yeah, no Every, chance. Everybody's no going to be dead. <laughs> I just want to know how you felt about this. It's not, I don't like chocolate. <laughs> we got problems. Are, are you just basically looking to hang around here tonight for a couple guys to pass out and pick up an arm or a leg? Well, you never know. Um, I'm getting kind of hungry. They make me not so happy because I know that now I fear that I'm a part of the ball club. Believe it. Don't you know it? Believe it. Believe it. That's right. Tell <laughs> it. You guys were a bunch of wackos from the beginning. We carried it all the way through the season, and now we're going to carry it in the postseason. It's awesome. It was a night I'll never forget. But one member of the team seems somewhat subdued. Do you feel like you showed everybody around the country that you are the dude? <laughs> Believe it. Uh, He's the dude, sports fans, and don't you forget it. Dude just sat in the corner and smiled. He knew that there was more work to do. He knew that our great adventure had just begun. The regular season was a great blueprint for success. The platoons had worked brilliantly. We got 99 RBIs from our right fielders and 133 from left. We had three guys score over 100 runs and blew away the rest of the league in scoring. And that's what baseball is all about. It's not how high your batting average can climb or how many home runs you can hit. It's how many times you can cross home plate or help somebody else do it. In the end, that's the only stat that counts. And that's what the 93 Phillies were all about. It was only the second Phillies team ever to have five starting pitchers with double-digit wins. And while it wasn't pretty, Mitch managed to set a club record with 43 saves. And now it was time to see if our formula for success would work in the postseason. It was to be the last NLCS before the wild card format. The Braves were still in the Western Division and had caught fire in the second half, erasing an 11-game deficit to beat out the Giants on the last day of the season. The Atlanta Braves, America's team, with all its Cy Young awards and pennants. Ha! I never liked Atlanta from day one because of the way they treated us on the field. You know, you, you always have your certain res respect or camaraderie with other teams, but they always acted like we didn't belong on the field with them. We didn't like the Braves, and I don't think we still don't like the Braves. You know, we, we wanted them to stick that tomahawk chop up there, you know what? They knew they were going to win, and uh, but everybody in that clubhouse wearing red and white pinstripes knew that we were going to win. We go every year and we expect to go. Uh, we know we're going and we're not surprised to be there. They hated us just for who we were. We had long hair. They weren't going to see us walking up with the exception of Dutch in a suit. We weren't flashy. We were Philadelphia. That's the most important thing. What an underdog needs is just somebody behind them, and we had our fans behind us. We had 60,000 people behind us, man. I mean, and they was behind us from start to finish. The whole city was electric for game one. Go to pitch. Swing and a miss. Struck him out. The 3-2 pitch. Swing and a miss. He struck him out. Kurt Schilling has struck out the side here in the first. As usual, the dude set the tone. One, two, pitch. Breaking ball. Line drive. Hit the left center field. It's going all the way back toward the fence. A stand-up double for the dude, Lenny Dykstra. Bouncing ball to second. Might be a double play. Throw to Blouser. One relay. Not in time. Here's Cole. Third strike. He struck him out. Struck him out. Five straight strikeouts to open the game. 
Swing and a hot shot. Backhanded brilliantly. Stocker low throw dug out by Crook. Jill really had it going. Then Inky flexed his muscle. In the air, center field and well hit. Nixon at the wall and looking up. Home run, Katie Cavillia. The Braves scratched out a couple runs to tie the score. Then we gave them that old whatever it takes approach. Bounces away. We took a 3-2 lead into the ninth, and despite Schill's protest, Jimmy stuck to the game plan, bringing in Mitch for the save. Kim Batiste was brought in for defense, and soon felt every role player's worst nightmare. A double play, one hopper, Batiste, threw it away! Into the game for defense, he threw it into right field. We all felt bad for Batty, but Mitch really bared down and got us into extra innings. Then you set the stage for some great theater. He drive to right. Yeah, I thought I got all of that one. But it's just as well I ended up on second. Doesn't it always seem like the baseball gods love to give a guy a shot at redemption? Winning run at second. Kim Batiste with a chance to redeem himself. Believe it. Swing a hard ground ball. Base hit! Base hit! championship series. It had been one of the greatest games in Fed history and another wild chapter in the drama that was 1993. In the papers the next day, some of the Braves commented that it was Bush League for us to carry Batty off the field, that we were showing too much emotion. And that's when I knew we had him. Before game two, a visitor came to the clubhouse. Dale Murphy had spent the past few years with the Phils before being traded in spring training. The longtime Brave star had some obvious split loyalty, which of course made him a huge target in our clubhouse. Let me ask you something. Have you already been over in the Braves clubhouse? Of course he has. I have not. He went over there first. Murph went over there first. <laughs> Murph you mind? Oh. Who are you sitting with in Atlanta? Teddy? <laughs> And Jane? Oh, yeah. well, hey, kid. Hey, kid. Right next to Jane. And kid, I'll hit you a foul ball. Maybe the security break down here after the game. I'll sign it. We'll be doing this with Jane. Yeah. 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 Uh, can you see him? Yeah, you say good luck. Congratulations. I get abused. I want to nice see him talking to you. And of course, the fanatic couldn't help but make fun of that other Atlanta institution, workout queen Jane Fonda. Here are the paid attendance being announced, 62,012. No comps here tonight. Everybody pays. When I pay, everybody pays. Swing <laughs> and a high towering fly to deep right field. This ball way out of here. Tremendous. In game two, Tommy Green ran into a buzzsaw named Fred McGriff, and the Braves were off on a romp. But a couple of interesting things happened in that game. Let me take you back to the previous offseason. Dave Hollins and I were at a charity event in Las Vegas when we ran into Greg Maddox. Dave, or Mikey, was pretty quiet until he finally informed Maddox that after hitting him four times in 92, such indignities would no longer be tolerated, and if it happened again, Maddox would be dead before the catcher could come to his rescue. The Braves hurdler giggled and looked at me as if to say, he's kidding, right? I just nodded no. Mikey had gotten into Cy Young's head. Field way back, it is gone! Dave Hollins with a two-run home run to put the Phillies on the board. Braves lead it eight to two. And one other player was setting the tone for a future at bat. Three, two, pitch, swing, and a high drive to deep right. This ball is out of here. Home run, Letty Dykstra, it's a 14 to three ball. Okay, the series was tied at one, and it was off to Atlanta.
There's a lot to be said for Southern hospitality, but you won't find any of it at Fulton County Stadium. You guys' favorite teams are Phillies, right? The Braves are gonna lose. Yes, they are. Yeah, that place can be a real house of horrors for an opponent. You know, all the chop stuff and the Braves mystique. The only thing is, that stuff didn't phase us at all. That's to deep left. Truck with a home run, and the Phillies lead 2 to nothing. There hasn't been a stolen base against this battery, but Nixon's going to try it, and he is out. Oh. Otis was right. You can't run on Terry Mulholland. Game three, Terry Mohan shut them down for five innings. Then the wheels came off. A one-two pitch. Well hit left field. It Cavalia. Can't get him. Okay, so we were down two games to one to the defending champs. You think we weren't still confident? The National League Championship Series, two games to one. Game four was huge. Danny Jackson took them out for what was easily the most important game of the season. DJ had been roughed up by the Braves in NLCS the previous year with the Pirates. He never even made it out of the second inning. Now, with revenge on his mind, he was about to pitch the game of his life. I mean, that game was ridiculous. I mean, he had an electric slider. He was, you know, hitting the spots. Boy, what a remarkable game. Man, he just shut him down. John Smoltz was just as tough, and we knew we were in for a war. Well hit, hit. Do it yourself, DJ. Thompson will come around to score. DJ gave us the performance of the year, and in the eighth, in came Mitch. Milt's catch saved the day, and Mitch nailed it down in the ninth. Swing and a ground ball to second, might be a double play. Morandini tags the bag, double play! This game is over! The Phillies have won it by a score of 2-1, to one, and even this league championship series at two games apiece. Game five was played the next day and the whole team was buzzing. It went today and we were in great shape. Everybody was fired up, except for you. I was out of bullets, Johnny. Yeah, you quietly told me there was no way you could pitch that day. That's how it felt. Well, it looked like it wouldn't matter. The shield looked pretty sharp and our defense rose to the occasion. Drive to left, Incavillia, great diving catch by the Eggman. Playing a line drive to right, it's a known for our glove work, but it seemed like everyone was coming up big. Swing and a well-hit ball to deep right center field. This ball is out of here. Home run, Darren Dalton, and the Phillies lead it three to nothing here in the ninth inning. Then Mitch came in to close it, and, well, they didn't call him Wild Thing for nothing. Somehow Mitch got out of it with the score tied and we headed for extra innings. With one out in the 10th, up stepped the dude. I knew that, you know, I needed to do something, you know, and I, I, I mean, I didn't say I'm gonna go hit a home run, but I, I just, as I was on the on-deck circle, I said, I gotta do something special here. 
Three, two, pitch, swing, and a well hit ball to deep center field. Nixon back. It's out of here. Home run, Lenny Dykstra. And the Bills have taken a four to three lead here in the 10th. Number two in this series for the dude. The only hits given up by Mark Wohler. So I look to see who's coming out for the bottom of the 10th, and there's the guy who told me there was no way he could pitch just a few hours before. Well, Johnny, you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah, and after two quick outs, you reached up your sleeve for one last magic trick. Game's on the line in the fifth game of the World Star of the playoffs. I, let's work on a new pitch, and he did, and oh my God. He had been messing with his pitch for some time now. And he could control it, you know, and, and Andy could hit a gnat in the butt with that slider. He kept shaking his head out on the mound, and I said, something's going on here. He threw him a split-finger fastball, a pitch that he does not have, but he was making him up as he went along. Uh, I figured after 20 years in the game, I might as well try to throw one once. I gave him the wiggle, and I remember him stopping and stepping on, and he looks back in there, and I gave him the wiggle, and said, come on, throw it. Just throw it, and sure enough, and he throws that thing in there, and it's stunning. Cold third strike, he struck him out. Bills have won the ball game four to three in ten innings. A one, two, three inning for Larry Anderson. It was my first and only save of the year, and probably the biggest moment of my career. And he's special. Nice goal. But in the post-game clubhouse, everybody was buzzing about the dude's home run. Remember coming around third base saying, didn't I? As he's slapping Bo's hand. One of my all-time favorite times of the, of the postseason is when Lenny hit that home run and he comes walking in and he's shaking his head and he goes, it's nice to be strong. <laughs> you know? And we're all like in the clubhouse going berserk and he's out doing the post game interview and the place it's just players in the clubhouse and the door opens and before you can even see who's coming in the clubhouse you hear somebody scream didn't I. Didn't I? He's the dude, ladies and gentlemen, and you better believe it. Game six, back in Philly, and the fans were in a frenzy. Greeny was back on the hill, looking for a little redemption of his own. I was just thinking the whole time, I said, I was hoping for an opportunity to be able to have another chance at him, a shot just to prove to myself and my teammates that, you know, I, I can, I'll be there. He took the first shot at the Braves' ace. Up the middle, off the leg of Maddox, and Karen's right to Lemke. Leo Mazzoni, the Braves' pitching coach, told me later that the ball really hurt Maddox and threw him off his game. Way to go, Mick. Then our leader made a statement. Up stepped Mikey to face his old nemesis. It was a changeup, and not his normal changeup that fades and get, it just stayed up, almost like he didn't have the same plant. Or I think Mickey hurt him, so he left it up. And uh, fortunately, I stayed back just long enough to get the barrel on it. Gone to the seats. Dave Hollins with a two-run home run. It's four to one Phillies. That's probably the biggest home run I've had in my career. That's my fondest memory right there. Then in the seventh, Mickey drove the nail in Maddox's coffin. Take it away, Whitey.
talk in this series about the Phillies and their unkempt style. So they brought in Steven Gunzenhauser, <laughs> the music director of the Delaware Symphony, to lend a little class and dignity to the proceedings. And what happens? They stole his baton as he was conducting the seventh inning stretch. Only in Philly could this happen. That's why I love this town. And this place, this joint was rocking now. And this is a very intimidating place to come and play in. And they, you could just feel it. Uh, I got chills running up my back right now. Tommy Green had done a great job. Back to back strikeouts in the inning for Tommy Green. Grab some pine, prime time. Westy blew away the Braves in the eighth, and in came Mitchie Poo to try and wrap up the pennant in front of 60,000 screaming maniacs. And in the clubhouse, we party. Just maybe not as hard as before, because now we could see the ultimate prize within our grasp. We were going to the big dance. You work your whole career to achieve one goal, and that's to get into a World Series, and obviously win it. But uh, just that feeling of uh, pride If you go back through spring training and, and the whole season and, and you look back at everything that you've been through, and let alone your whole career, but just that season and, and the, the, the people that are in that clubhouse and how it all worked out. You know, you plan something and then when it comes to fruition, uh, there's not a better feeling for anybody in the organization because that's, that's your only goal. And boom, we're here. We're in the World Series. Yeah, it was another great night. A lot of love and a lot of laughs, and one final chapter in this great story. Three balls and two strikes to Bill Pakoda. Whitey, can Mitchie Poo have one, two, three hitting? No way. <laughs> Swing and a miss, he struck him out, yeah, and the Phillies are the 93 National League. Yeah! At first, it was a little hard to comprehend. There we were, the ragged, dirtball, America's most wanted Phillies, saluting the flag and representing the United States in a foreign country. Yeah, that's a scary thought, Andy, but I think we handled it well. I mean, it's the way we are, you know, like the, the hair and the, the beard and everything. I mean, we had it last year, but we were so bad, no one cared. But now, you know, you win a few games and everyone wants to know about it. I mean, it's just hair. Swing and a looper into left center, base hit, rounding third, Dykstra, he'll score, and the Phillies lead it one to nothing. Fastball, line drive, base hit, right field, juggled by Carter, Truck scores, Hollins to third, Phillies lead two nothing in the first, on an RBI single by Dutch Dalton. We jumped out to an early lead in game one, but Schilling got off the game plan. It was weird, but I, I can remember going out uh, and when I turned around to look at home plate, I thought, there's a billion people watching this game. How cool is that? Devon White has tied the game 4-4 with a long home run to right field, and we're all even again. Just didn't pitch real well. First game, I thought I needed this big game plan, and, and uh, instead of listening to Vuk like I had all year, I kind of tried to do my own thing, and 
we ended up getting beat. Here's a long drive. This looks like another one. Home run, John O'Rourke. In game two, Terry Mohan cranked up a good one. Swing and a miss for strike three. With a little help from his friends. One out. He is running. The pitch is strike. The throw. Good one. And Henderson is out. And after years of struggling against much greater obstacles and opposing pitchers, Jim Eisenreich had finally made it to the World Series. A three-run homer for Jim Eisenreich, and the Phillies lead five to nothing. Now, in the glare of the international spotlight, Lenny really took it to the next level. Swing and a well-hit ball to deep right. It's got a chance. This ball's out of here. Home run, Lenny Dykstra. And the Phillies now lead it six to three here in the seventh. Ground ball is short. That might be two to Duncan. One, yes, double play. Mitch finished it, and we were headed back home. In game three, a long rain delay held up the game. And from the beginning, DJ was out of sync. The 2-1 pitch, line drive, hit to right center. Henderson scores and skips by Eisenreich. Here comes Devon White around. He scores Molitor to third, sliding with a triple. And we all got to see what a hitter Paul Molitor turned out to be. To a line drive left field, out of here. Home run, Paul Molitor. It got out that quick. And game three of the World Series goes to Toronto. By a count of 10 to 3. Game 4 was a game for the ages. Yeah, the dark ages. It was an old fashioned slugfest. The Jays scored 3 in the first, and we roared back for 4. It's the 2 2 pitch swing and a well hit ball to deep center. White back, and he can't get it. The two teams squared off like heavyweight boxers fighting toe to toe. The drive to deep right field, fair foul, fair ball out of here. Home run, the dude. And the Phillies have taken a 6 to 3 lead here in the second inning. while it looked like the Phillies had just too much firepower. Seven, a double for Bill Thompson. Then the rains came and the game took on the appearance of a Hollywood spectacle. And we all know who the leading man was. He's been on base all three times tonight and has scored three times. He walked stole second and scored in the first and a two run homer in the second. Just missed a home run with a double off the wall and right in the fourth and scored again. about this all the time. I went up to the plate the last time we were winning by we had 14 runs. I went up to the plate the last time with two outs and the bases loaded with having to hit a home run for the cycle that game. I know I'm not a home run hitter but the first time I kind of let it out and if I just just kept myself together and I ended up hitting the ball up the middle that Alomar made a great play and got to force it second. And at the time, you don't think about it because we were up 14 to 9. But, you know, that night I had a chance to think about that situation. Um, sometimes when you, when you see 
goals or something that you you take oh man this is incredible no one's done this and you and you you fall out of sync and don't stay focused on on what the goal is being up 14 to 9 I didn't think about how important those runs were but later on it, it came back to haunt me and I was like oh my god no you're not to blame Milt it was Mitch and I who couldn't hold the lead Second. Give the Blue Jays credit. They just kept coming after us. It's 14 to 10. Base hit. Olerud scores. Molitor is. And run after run kept crossing the plate. And the towel is back over the eyes of Kurt Schilling. A familiar pose during this postseason. As far as what Schill was doing with the towel and all that, uh, that was addressed in the clubhouse. And Schill always knew where the cameras were and uh, took advantage of it. But. Uh, the thing that disheartened me about that was was the reflection it, it threw on Mitch, you know, and, and here's Mitch coming in, busting his butt, you know, doing all he can to save a ball game. The one regret I have is the whole towel incident in the postseason. Uh, I was, whether you want to call it stupid, naive, I had no idea that what I was doing was offensive. Certain things you do, and there's certain things you don't do. And if that hadn't have been a World Series, I'd have beat nine kinds of out of him for it. Pitch line drive into center. Dykstra coming, can't get it. Base hit, two runs will score. It's now a 14 to 13 game. Yeah, and our Hollywood epic had turned into Gone with the Wind. Fly ball, right center field. Dykstra can't get it. It's all the way back to the fence. Porter scores, Henderson scores, and Toronto leads it 15 to 14. Game five, our backs to the wall, and Kurt Schilling gives us the game of his life. I really felt like I didn't have any options, and, I, and it was a good thing. I just, you, when, you, when you looked at the lineup as a whole that we were facing, it, was, it could have been very intimidating. Uh, coming off the 15-14 game, you had a city that was horribly depressed, but the team that just said, you know what, if we're gonna do this, we gotta do it tonight. Got an early lead and defensively it held up for the rest of the game. You know, coming up uh, eighth inning, we get into a situation in which I've had two innings in my career. I look back on and say that was everything I had. And the eighth inning of Game Five was the first time I ever said, you know, I gave that inning everything I could possibly give it. Say what you want about Schill. That night he became a big game pitcher and turned in one of the most clutch performances in the history of this stadium. Line to center, Dykstra is there, the Phillies win. A brilliant five hit shutout for Kurt Schilling. Back to Canada, and nobody on this team was ready to quit. There was a strong feeling that if we could just get it to game seven, the series would be ours. Every man in that clubhouse felt that, you know, had we won that night, we had a very good, very good chance of winning game seven because we had Danny Jackson going for us. I knew we were going to win that game. I knew that we were going to play game seven. And I've since talked to some guys on their team, and they were so concerned about winning game six because they did not want to face us in game seven. But Paul Mahler was just killing us. All to the right center, well hit.
We were down five to one in the seventh, but had just enough grit to fight back one more time. Line drive, base hit. Over to the glove of Fernandez. Cut off by Henderson. Stalker continues to third, and here come the Phillies. for taking Roger Mason out of the game. But what would you have Mason do? Pitch the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth? I don't think so. Roger, man, he did his job. He got us two innings. I think that if you look at that game, the biggest problem we had was the eighth inning. I've heard 500 times Roger Mason should have never been taken out of that game. And if you, you look at what he was doing, yeah. But if Fergosi leaves him in to throw the ninth inning, and Roger loses that game. Fergosi gets hung. Why would you leave him in there when you've got your closer done it all? Jimmy did exactly what he was supposed to do, and it didn't work out. Ball four. West walks all the room on five pitches. Jimmy knew I was done. He knew Westy was done. And he knew Larry was done. But the old saying, you got to dance with what brung you, uh, uh, you have to. Bases loaded. Griffin, the tying run at third against Larry Anderson, who took nine and a half years in the minors to establish himself as a full time major league player at age 30. He admitted there were many times over that stretch he thought about quitting baseball. Vowed from that day forward to enjoy every aspect of Major League Baseball. Couldn't be in a more memorable situation than this. A one two to Borders is a pop up. Mickey Morandini wants it. And he makes the catch. I know you're running on fumes, LA, but at least you got us to the ninth. When Jimmy brought Mitch in for the ninth, I didn't have a question in my mind that we were going to win that game. I knew he was going to, and even when we got to the situation with, you know, with, with Carter hitting and, and all that, I felt very confident we were going to win that game. I was up. I was up uh, before that. I mean, everybody's going to second guess, you know, but that's Mitch's, that was Mitch's job. He'd been there all year doing that. I mean, you're going to throw a guy in the World Series and six game in the World Series and never close the game for? Mitch is Mitch. Mitch is going to take the ball whether he's in a cast. He'll throw it his right hand, you know. He ran out of bullets, bottom line. He didn't run out of heart. He just ran out of bullets. He, he, he threw more than anybody in the game that I've ever played with or against. I'm not sure I couldn't have kicked it home harder than I was throwing it, but you live for that situation, and they couldn't have pried that ball out of my hand with the jaws of life. I knew he'd, he didn't have the good velocity, but uh, you know, still he's able to get some outs, and without him, they would not have been there you know, in that World Series. Uh, two and one, he throws me a good fastball down the middle of the plate, and I take it. I say, okay, now I'm ready. I've said it over and over again. The only thing I ever regret about that series is that I didn't throw it from a full motion. I threw it from a slide step, and needless to say, I don't have trouble getting the ball up and away. And that's where that pitch was supposed to be, and I jerked it down and into one of the few right-handed hitters you don't miss down and into. That was my only regret. When he gave me the slide step, I was still looking slider. He threw the, the fastball, it had more like a, a hard slider, a cut action fastball on it. Uh, and all I did was react to it. And 
and I looked up and I looked into the lights and then I see the ball going over the fence. And my first thought was, what am I going to do tomorrow? Because I'd already planned on coming here and I knew that we were going to win that game. And, uh, but we didn't. I mean, that, that home run he hit, you know, cut everybody's heart out. You know, I mean, we had fought so hard and played so hard the whole year. I mean, uh, you know, if there's such a thing as giving 110%, we gave 130% that year. I couldn't be prouder of a group of guys. Uh, they were all stand-up guys. If they followed up a game, they would stand up and admit it. Uh, there was no excuses made. Uh, and they really gave all that they could give. The sad part is, is I know in my heart we should have won that series. And that, that was the hardest part for me. The way we performed offensively and the pitching, the starting pitching, and basically it came down to, to my time in the game and, and I didn't get it done. That was the hard part. When that ball went over the fence, it was the finality of this great seat, this great ride is over. But I walked in the, I walked in the clubhouse and gave Mitch a, the biggest hug and I said, you know what? If it wasn't for you, we, we never would have got here. And so it was over. We'd come as far as the baseball gods would allow. It was a great ride. We captured the hearts of a whole city and had the best time of our lives doing it. No one on that team has any reason to hang their head. We were winners. And they'll probably never see the likes of us again. People can't grasp that our live around the country or have played in other cities, uh, what it's like to win in Philadelphia. Uh, the fans here, they feel it with you. They feel the wins, they feel the losses, and they celebrate on this field with those fans, because that's a big part of it. It's not just the players, it's the fans, it's the city, and, and that was a special thing. I was in awe of what we had done, and where we had gone, and what, what we had experienced, and, and really, we turned this country into Philly fans. We were America's team for about a two-week period, and that was, that was pretty cool. Even though Toronto was the world champions, there was probably more focus on that club of ours. There's probably been more focus on that club losing the World Series than a lot of clubs that win it. That team has got something to give back to baseball, I think, of the old way. In every city I could go into, I have people that'll come up to me and say, hey, thanks for 93. We're here in the Phillies clubhouse. This is where all the action took place before the media came in, of course. This locker right here used to be Mariano Duncan's locker. Mariano had these clothes that would, would uh, retro clothes from the 70s that he used to wear with all the colors and, 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 and all the beautiful things that he did. And, but Mariano was probably the funniest guy on the team. No one knows that because of his la the language barrier, but he was the funniest guy. Dave Hollins, the locker was right here. Sometimes Dave, most of the time Mikey. Mikey had a little, you know, his other personality, his alter ego. And this locker, it's a wonder it's still standing because he destroyed it two or three times. And I'm sure that they had to reinforce this whole thing because he had a little temper. This locker here, tank head, Todd Pratt. Young guy, you know, we let him down into our area, a little area down here, because we thought he would be fun. And he was. He was a fun guy to have in, around here. And again, he's like Mariano Duncan. People don't know it because he didn't get much uh, much playing time, but Tank was one of the funnier guys we had. We kept this locker empty because all the stuff that came from my locker, which is now Real Cormier's, this was my locker, and all the stuff that filtered out, the trash and everything that I never cleaned up all year because I was a slob, came into this locker, and Tank actually one day tried to get some of his stuff over into this locker, and I told him, I said, look, you're young, you're a rookie, get your crap out of my locker. Because I need, he said, well, you already got a big one in this one. I said, how much you, I said, believe me, you'll see by the end of the year all the crap that I have that's piled up. And it took him like two or three days for the clubhouse kids to clean this thing after the season was over. This one was Lenny's. Lenny Dykstra had his locker here, and he had, used to have a, a sandbox right here where he'd spit his tobacco when, when he was sitting here getting dressed. 
And Lenny kept an, uh, amazingly kept an immaculate locker, like really clean. He was disappointed in myself that I was such a slob because after a while stuff would start sliding underneath and like papers and letters and stuff would fly underneath and, and, and he got kind of upset with that. But you know, Lenny was okay. Didn't talk a whole lot, very quiet guy. People don't know that about him. Right here was Inky, Steve, uh, Pete Incavilia. Um, Inky was a new guy on the team, but we thought, you know, with his charm and personality, we could let him down here. And plus, he was a little psycho, so it was good to have a, a, another guy down here that can keep, you know, as long as we kept the pitchers out. That's what was the main thing. We, you know, look, Larry Anderson, David West, they were all up there where they belong, the pitchers at the other end. The only one pitcher that we allowed down here, but he wasn't really a pitcher. You guys have seen him pitch. He just threw the ball hard and actually did not know where it was going. Mitch Williams' locker was right here. This is where Mitch whined and complained about saves and blown saves and, you know, I walked too many guys. You know, he's, he's not telling us anything we don't know because we had to be out there and watch that crap. This locker right here, I'll never say anything bad about this man, Darren Dalton, our leader, our fearless leader, the guy who, who willed us to win in 1993. This was his locker. I don't know how me and him got the two big lockers. I can understand him. Why I got one, I have no idea. But like I said, this was called Macho Row. We don't know who started that name, but it wasn't us because we didn't see ourselves as macho. And, and actually, the lockers were great, everything was great, but the real action took place in the training room, after the games, away from the media, because media is not allowed in there. This is the place where it all took place for the Phillies right here. This is where games were won and lost in the training room. Now, you guys aren't allowed in here, but no one's here, so come on in. Let's go. See, now these weights and everything, this is the modern player. These weren't here when I was here because we didn't lift weights. We lifted pitchers of beer. And I can tell you where everyone sat. It was like a ritual every night. There, the, the, there was a training table right there. Darren Dalton sat there. All he had on was his sliding shorts, no shirt because, you know, he had that great body and everyone was jealous. This was my seat right here. And actually, when I would walk in after the game, there'd be two pitchers of beer here, a pack of cigarettes, and and an ashtray right here, of course, with the health of the players now, none of them do that stuff. Mitch always came in here and sat and told us how great he pitched, so we knew that was a lie. There was a lot of lying in this room, too. Uh, Inky would sit here on this table, and Dave Hollins would sit on the end. Lenny would sit back here in the corner with about 50 towels bunched up around him and eating watermelon and spitting the seeds all over the floor, but he would use the towels there to spit his tobacco juice in and it was disgusting. He was, a, he was a disgusting guy. Yeah, you know, I said he kept his locker clean. He was, he was a pigsty, though, but I ain't going to lie. But this is where we all sat, and we stayed here till you know, 2, 3, 4 in the morning talking baseball. This is the play. This is the burial ground. This is where every pitcher, every player, and no one was immune to it. Dalton, Dykstra, myself, if we played bad or made bad mistakes, mental mistakes, we all got buried in this room, and it was the greatest. This is the greatest place. This is where our team came together. And this is where we actually won games, won and lost games in here to take it out there for the next day. Look, at, these guys are healthy now. This stuff is, I tell you why, you see, Inky, Dalton, and Hollins, and Dykstra used to come back here after games, every, like, like every, other, every other home game. And they would come in here and lift weights, and you know, and, and, and I would sit here with, with a beer and an ashtray and, and, and can't understand why they were grunting and sweating and, and like trying to build their bodies up. When we just had to play again the next day, I thought, you know, rest would be better, but this room is the, the greatest room ever as far as the Phillies are concerned. It was a pigsty. There was pizza everywhere. I mean, pizza from like, from like three, home, three home stands prior. Pizza boxes still laying around. Video Dan Stevenson, he couldn't keep control. He couldn't clean it because these guys were such slobs. But, you know, we figured we had one good year. We had one run. And we knew it was only gonna be a one year run. So we might as well enjoy it while we could, and we did. So we made the most of it. Or, or tell the people back here just exactly what you think of me, what a great guy I am. Could you expound on that a little bit? You're an old fart. You know, you just happen to be hanging around, and, and, and we let you get in the middle of this. But you're an old fart. You probably got another year or two in you. Um, could you tell me what, what, uh, what, what do you really think of me? I usually, I usually don't, don't Larry. I don't usually think of you at all to speak of, and actually, I think you're, you're an. Asshole. I mean, you, you, you really helped my self-esteem, and there's been times when I just thought it wasn't worth it, but I called on you, Larry, and, and, and I tell you, you helped me out. 
Well, that's that's all you have to say about me? That's all. Having a good hair night? Uh, great hair night, man. Because the team led the whole run scoring bit last year. And, uh, you know, if we give them a chance to win the ball game, they can do it. And that's what it come down to. And didn't we? Believe it. Thank you. You're not going to be able to fit the mask around your head tomorrow uh, <laughs> after the celebration night. Uh, do you think that's going to be a problem? Uh, no problem at all, you know. If, you know. I'll probably see three baseballs tomorrow, but I'll just swing the middle one. I hope I do the job. <laughs> Haven't you done it all year? Believe it. Believe it. I want to see Jerome. Jerome is in the house. I'm Kevin Stalker, and I'm here with Kurt Schilling, people, ladies and gentlemen. And hey, a quick interview, Kurt, Best you know. You up on a camera. <laughs> First interview of the night, ain't it, Kurt? <laughs> Kurt, tell us about how you feel right now. What, what's, what's going through your mind? Uh, I'm, I'm That's really great. Okay, well, now, what, what's, what was going through your mind after we won? Well, I felt pretty good That's about great. And then when you got your new award, what, how'd that feel? It felt really good. Okay, and with Kurt Schilling, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't it special? Ain't it. <laughs> <laughs> I'd kill him, but we need him for seven more days. And I'd like to thank the fans also uh, for the recognition. Uh, that, that was nice to be voted in. It's amazing the fans want to see me play. It's a scary thought of the whole thing. What our society's come to these days, but... You know, they, they want to see it, so I guess we have no choice but to go. Jake and Dutch, John Cruck, <laughs> and Darren Dalton. Friends, teammates, lovers. Now, essentially, what we're trying to correlate here is John Cruck, first baseman, Philadelphia Phillies, and the fall of civilization as we know it. Brian Harvey, here's a question. John Cruck, I mean, if you look at the man, forget the hair, forget the goatee. He may not look too good, but he sure can hit. Yeah. I don't know. I got my theory for pitching is no gut, no gas. So, uh, you know. Uh, maybe it's in the hair. Maybe it's Samson. Who knows? Because I've been after him for two years to get a haircut. He hadn't done it. At least he trimmed his beard that he that so-called beard that he had. John Crux is a great guy. He's a really wonderful guy, and he can play baseball too. Although people look at him, they say, "Wow, is he a baseball player? He really can play." John Crux hitting 350, man. I don't care. It don't matter what you look like. That boy can hit. Straight up. I want to walk with you. I want to look real fit. He's still gonna be real short. I don't know, man. He thinks that he shouldn't. He shouldn't be playing here, man. I told him, man. There's nothing about that, man. It doesn't. Doesn't matter how you look. And he... John John Cruck is a role model. <laughs> I think he's a good role model. I mean, if you think Charles Manson's a role model, and I guess John Cruck would be too. Let's see. You can look at Steve Garvey, clean cut, or John Cruck. So which one would you pick? Brian Sandberg, a uh, good milk drinker. <laughs> I don't know. Don't ask me anything about somebody I really don't know. Oh. Cal Ripken, good milk drinker. Oh, I don't know about Cruck, man. I don't know. He's, he's strange. I'm still trying to figure him out. But... Well, it just shows you that uh, anything can happen in America. He's every couch potato's uh, ultimate dream. The society is really, really coming to a to a standstill now when when something like this can happen. Well, as John uh, uh, paraphrased, I'll paraphrase John. He said uh, they voted Bill Clinton in, and he's still in. I mean, after all, this is America. There were a lot of people who said we could never change the way things were in Washington. Same sort of people who picked the Phillies to finish last this year. I just, I'm just wondering if people that voted for John Cruck will admit it, unlike the people that voted for Bill Clinton. By the way, I think the Phillies are looking pretty good. Even that big fella Cruck, you know, the big bat. Wonder who cuts his hair. <laughs> Two baseball needs John Cruck. Why so? Oh, I don't know. I just, I don't know. He just, he just looks like he's had a little more fun than some of the other people. 6'10 and a half, almost 6'11. That's the largest man in the history of baseball on the mound against you, John Crook. I'm not facing him. I'll quit. You don't like to face Randy? I don't know. I've just seen him on TV, and I don't want no part of that. John Crook standing 
himself off. Johnson has had pitches clocked at as much as 102 miles per hour in Major League play. Would you say his heart is palpitating a bit? <laughs> Look at the next step. I don't blame John one bit for going toward first. And you can see him smiling. The first one's over his head, and then look at this. Looks like a rope was on his right leg. <laughs> <laughs> and he bailed out again at the breaking He ball. wants no part of Randy Johnson. None. Nada. <laughs> you knew that was coming. John had no chance. You keep talking about how much you like this team and you like this bunch of guys. Uh, why is this team so attractive to you? Uh, I kind of like, uh, kind of like family. You know, they're all a bunch of sick. I wouldn't say it's an insane asylum. I mean, that's that's embarrassing. We're not insane. We're all just normal guys and just out of our mind. This team is. Uh, it's eerie. It's out of this world. It is. The, uh... <laughs> no, not really. We got a bunch of uh, different personalities here. Oh, without a doubt. The craziest clubhouse I've ever been in. There's like uh, 15 of us that have split personalities. I think if you took all the B-horror flicks ever made and all the killers and mass murders and all of them, they're probably living in our clubhouse somewhere. Because I think the warden, I mean the general manager of this club, has done a fine job in assembling the prison, prison squad. You know, we got a good mix. We got a bunch of idiots and Murph and... John Crux said it best. He said, you know, Mormons have to go on their missions and some go to Africa and some go to Australia and Murphy came to the Phillies clubhouse, so... Uh... Nothing we do in the clubhouse should ever be tried at home. Well, I figured the crazier the team, the more games we're going to win this year. Uh... I think overall the team gets along real well. And... You're a dead man. I never seen so many guys so excited every day to get up and come to the clubhouse. You know, you, you never know what's going to happen. It's like a zoo. Look at all these. You know what I want to say? I am not an animal. <laughs> and it's like uh, it's like romper room. You know, I mean, you never know what you're going to see or what's going to happen or who's going to do what. Or... Oh! <laughs> uh... <laughs> There you go again, you're calling a psycho. We're not psycho. How do you feel about this year's club? <laughs> it's unbelievable. I told Jimmy I died and went to heaven. We're gonna have a great year. I can see it coming. We got a chance to have a real good staff. You know, we got we can send five starters out there and you know, Tommy Green. We got a bunch of idiots sometimes, you know. Myself being the number one pun, you know. When Tommy comes in, hey here's Tommy. <laughs> All right, he's gone. All right, okay. A couple here call me Jethro. Uh, hey, you gotta go like this. You gotta go with the open eye check. All right. Okay. All right, he's gone. He's gone. Schilling has got to have the world's worst body. Oh, scary. I don't know. I, I've always said that I have a terrible body, which I do. It's not a body. This is a cruel family joke. Look at Greeny. There's, there's a, there's a survivor. The gene pool. Who? <laughs> Terry. Well, Terry, Terry, Terry's a specimen, but uh, second world's worth worst athlete <laughs> next to Schilling. How, uh, how could he, uh, how could Terry Mulholland even say something about us uh, when every time he opens his mouth, he puts the whole room to sleep? Uh, Sounds <laughs> like that guy yeah. from the old. He's got that boys. deep bass voice there, and he just lures you to sleep. He's ready. He's primed. He's lubed. His hair is lubed. He's ready. He's going. He's yes. He's everything, folks. He's Danny Jackson. If you want a nickname, we call him Jason. He's he's got two sides to him. You know, if you see him out there and he looks like an all-American boy and and um, really looks like he's got his stuff together, uh, you've got the wrong idea because this guy's a real sick puppy and fits in actually well on this team. Makes some of the other sick guys on this team look well. We call Ben Shaq. Shaq because he looks like Shaquille O'Neal. The big, tall, right-hander, 6'5", from my hometown. The Shack Attack. The Shack Attack. Shack Attack. Shack 2. Nasty, Nasty right. Cur. Cy Youngman? Yeah. 
when I'm thinking about a Terry Mahalan, a Kurt Schilling, and Ben Rivera, the way he pitched, and with the addition of Danny Jackson, you know, I'll tell you, we got a chance to have a real good staff, you know. People ask me about him all the time. What was Lenny Dykstra like? I say, you know what? In the locker room, he was very quiet. And, and they look at me like, no, he's running around yelling and screaming. I said, no. I said, he basically came in, sat in his locker, and, and spit Dr. Pepper on his shoes to clean him and, and didn't say a whole lot. Like he would come up and start to tell you a story, then he'd leave and go in the training room, and then an hour later come back and you say, hey, Lenny, finish that story. And he's like, well, what are you talking about, dude? I, I don't, what was I talking about? I'm like, okay. The dude was an experience. You know, uh, the dude would be an experience even if it had nothing to do with baseball. I mean, you could, you could run into Lenny, I'm sure, um, away from the field and uh, come away a little bit dazed and confused as to just what exactly just happened. But, uh, you know, Lenny, I think, was, uh, if there's such a definition as a creature of habit or a guy that's superstitious or has his routine or needs to, to do things, you know, consistently um, as far as preparation goes it was Lenny I mean you know I think Franklin that year sent him like over 500 pairs of batting gloves because you know if he, he made an out or he didn't like the way they felt they were in the trash. And I used to pick all these new gloves out of the can for my son Vince who was young at that time and take them home I mean they, they didn't even have any pine tar on them yet. But Lenny was very superstitious nobody could touch his bat if he was hitting good uh, I remember a pitcher picked it up one time during BP, and he, and he looked over there, and he said, whose bat's that? And he said, it's yours. He says, give me that thing. And he went nuts. You know, it was like, don't, this is sacred. Don't touch this while I'm going good. If I'm over for 4, you can use all my bats. When I get two or three hits, I don't want you to touch anything. But uh, he would wear the same undershirt if he was hitting good. Obviously, if he wasn't, he'd be changing, but very superstitious. Well, you know, in this game of baseball, man, it's a great game, but it can also humble you quick. I mean, and, uh, you know, I, you know, I got you get to the point where you, you can't stop it. You know, if something you don't get a hit, you think it's because you had your chew or your batting gloves on a different way, or you, you wore the wrong undershirt, and so you know, especially when you're winning, you know, you combine trying to be successful not only as an individual, but then you know when your team's winning, you combine. So I had dual superstition angles going. It was a, an amusement park. It was hands down the funnest baseball environment I've ever been around because there were no boundaries as to what you could say, what you could do. You get 25 guys with over 75% incredibly immature together, you know, for 180 days, and there's stuff has to happen. That cast of characters, you know, they, they were just so much fun to be around. And I'll never forget when, um, when Joe Carter beat us in game six, we fly back to Philadelphia. Now they're like, that team really captured the imagination of the Phillies fans and the public. There were like several thousand fans to greet us even after we had lost the World Series. And I'm walking off the plane behind Larry Anderson and L.A.'s doing like this. I said, L.A., what are you doing? We, we, we didn't, what's the V for victory? We didn't win. He said, no, that means we're number two. <laughs>
We admire certain players for their speed, their style, some for their strength, and some for how they play the game. And once we've chosen our favorite players, we revel in their deeds. It may be the star player achieving a milestone, or the steady role player doing the impossible. It may be a key hit in the biggest game of the year, or a late night miracle in front of a few loyal believers. Baseball is all about success and failure. Into the game for defense, he threw it into right field. But somehow the script always seems to provide a chance for redemption. Our ground ball, base hit, base hit, those win, and the RBI hit by Kim Batke. This place is going wild. This is Harry Callis. For almost 30 years, I've been lucky enough to be one of the voices who brought you Phillies baseball. As part of our end of the century celebration, We'll take a look back at the last 100 years of our fighting Phils. From the fabled teams of yesteryear to the great individual performances. We'll revisit all the great moments of the franchise and then finish with the top greatest moments in Phillies history as voted by you, the fans. So strap in for a very special trip down memory lane and have a great flashback. The Philadelphia Phillies are one of the oldest sports franchises in the United States. The Fightin' Phils. There's a lot of history here. Seems like I spent most of my adult life on or around this team. I've been through the hard times and I've seen the glory days. My name is Larry Boa and I'm the manager. It's my mission to get you to remember the fightings. Isn't it amazing that a little white ball can serve as a bond between generations? Baseball is a game to be handed down like a family heirloom. From fathers to sons to grandsons. From mothers to daughters. From the teacher to his pupils. It's about helping a child's dream to come true. It's about the veteran helping the young rookie. And it's about the young apprentice learning from the master. It's simply the greatest game in the world. And it's all about connecting generations. I am Pat Burrell. 
I'm Harry Callis. We'll be your host for the 2002 Phillies Video Yearbook. Connecting, Connecting Generations. It was electricity. It was spine chilling. For National League playoffs between Houston and, and Philadelphia were without question the most action-packed league championship series in history. Great athletes, they rise and they get, get the job done. You got the feeling that, that, that those games could go on and on and on, like a heavyweight championship bout where both fighters can withstand punches. This was a real bunch of battlers and, and people that weren't lovey-dovey to each other all the time either. This was not the good ship Philly. You know, this was not a happy bunch of people. There was such a chip on the club's shoulder that it worked to our advantage. It was almost like we weren't going to be denied. No matter what happened, we weren't going to be denied. We were playing for a lot then, and uh, the object of the game is to win the game, and you have to do whatever you can. We had 25 guys that wanted to play. We didn't have three or four happy to be on the bench. We had 25 guys wanting to play. It's such a trite saying, hey, we did it for our fans. It was truly for all of us. The love affair between the Philadelphia fans and that ball club was something I'll never forget. My name is Dallas Green. A baseball life can be filled with equal parts joy and equal parts heartache. The prestige and glamour of the big leagues are often balanced by countless lonely hours away from home. But if you're lucky, with a lot of sweat and hard work, you eventually get the taste of glory. In the fall of 1980, I got the taste of glory. Yet glory can be very hollow unless it's shared. That autumn, I shared it with 25 men who would run through a brick wall to win a ball game, with a staff of dedicated coaches who knew what it took to win, with an owner and general manager as close to me as family and with a few million people who call themselves Phillies fans. These were our glory days. This is our story. Hi, this is John Crook, and welcome to Veteran Stadium. This place holds a lot of memories for me, and even in its final season, the vet has proven it can still provide some pretty special moments. Now, I've never been one to pay too much attention to pitchers, but outside of playing in the postseason, there's nothing like being involved in a no-hitter. I was lucky enough to be in two of them. Our ground ball three, Graham Green, it's over. He's pitched a no-hit, no-run game, making the final out himself. Tommy Green, a no-hitter. Now, Tommy Green had walked so many guys, I didn't even realize he had a no-hitter going until the ninth inning. And it really wasn't that much fun to do it in front of those 30 or 40 people in Montreal. 
The fun part was when we were all getting ready for the flight home and told Tom he had to stay in Canada because the Prime Minister wanted to invite him for dinner. In 1990, we were almost on the wrong end of a no-hitter, as Doug Drabeck took it all the way up to two outs in the ninth. Up stepped one of the most feared hitters in Philly's history, Sil Camposano. 3-2 pitch, swing and a line drive hit to right center field. I can't believe it. Sil Camposano has singled to right center with two outs in the ninth inning to break up a no-hit bid by Doug Grayback. No hitter? Gone. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, Terry Mohan did it right. In front of a big crowd, he actually took a perfect game into the seventh until the first baseman couldn't hold the bag. But the defense was solid. Change up to Thon. There's one. On to first. There's two. There's your double play. And Terry was nasty. Thirty-two thousand plus on their feet at Veterans Stadium. One ball and two strikes. Here's the one-two pitch. Line drive, great ball! Charlie Hayes! Charlie Hayes spares it, and Mulholland has pitched a no-hit, no-run game at Veterans Stadium. The first nine-inning no-hitter in the history of the match. Can you believe it? Games like that are something you remember forever, whether you're a player or a fan. And on April 27th, we all got treated to a beautiful slice of baseball history. In the following hour, we will take a look back at Kevin Millwood's brilliant no-hitter and relive one of the greatest games ever played on this field of memories.